Hello and welcome once again to Fly With Your Shadow. I'm your host, Jeff Robson. This show is designed to be about a wide range of topics, all revolving around music. The past couple of weeks have been really informative and interesting here on the show, and they've focused a lot on mental illness. We'll definitely get back to more of that in our next episode, but sometimes I just like to sit around and talk about music with someone I'm really interested in and that I really admire. One of the things I miss most these days is hanging out with my friends at concerts and just talking about music. So this show offers me the opportunity to have some in-depth conversations with people who not only appreciate music, but some who make my favorite music as well. Recently, I got to talk to a member of a really pivotal band for me, one that helped develop my love of live music and piqued my interest about the fertile music scene here in Winnipeg. He also happens to be preparing for the release of an exciting new album, so it was a great opportunity to be able to talk to someone I've admired for a long time. Hey guys, this is Joey Serlin from Serlin Graves and the Watchmen. The Watchmen were the first local band that I really became obsessed with. I was surprised to find out after hearing them that Winnipeg had, and obviously still has, an incredible original live music scene. Early bands like the Guess Who and BTO broke ground, and it's been followed up by bands like the Weaker Thans and the Wayland Jennies. Our music scene wouldn't get as strong as it is without great venues like the West End Cultural Centre, the Park Theatre, and clubs like the Royal Albert, the Pyramid Cabaret, which was called the Spectrum back when the Watchmen were regulars there, and Times Changed High and Lonesome Club. Our scene has also benefited greatly from industry figures that really championed local music like Kevin Walters and iconic rock radio DJ Howard Manshine, among many others. Initially, The Watchmen was comprised of Joey Serlin on guitar, Pete Lowen on bass, Sammy Cohen on drums, and lead singer Danny Graves. They're a rock and roll band first and foremost, but with great pop sensibilities. They weren't unlike a Canadian version of R.E.M. Unlike a lot of other rock bands, though, Watchmen lead singer Danny Graves has a really powerful, soulful, smooth-sounding voice. They're marvelously able to do quieter, introspective songs and really rock out with the best of them. They released their first album, McLaren Furnace Room, in 1993. It was named after their rehearsal space in the basement of a rather seedy hotel in downtown Winnipeg. That album launched them in a big way and led to a heavy touring schedule that didn't stop for years. Their original bass player wasn't cut out for that kind of grind after a while, so they made the switch and added Ken Tizzard from Canada's East Coast. Together, the band exploded even more with some of the biggest rock radio hits in Canada in the mid to late 90s. As you'll hear coming up, the band eventually burned out after an album called Slow Motion in 2001. That was a double disc made up of a new album that had more of a modern electronic influence sound and that was packaged alongside a retrospective disc. All the band members had already relocated to Toronto over the course of their career, uh, and when they went their separate ways, they set up new careers and new directions. Danny Graves bought a bar called Motel, and these days he can be heard pretty often on CBC's National Music Station, where he's a frequent guest host. We'll get into what Joey's been up to as we dive into the conversation I had with him as he and Danny are preparing for the release of a new album that they made together under the name Serlin Graves. You'll have to excuse me if I if I turn into a gushing fanboy. The, the Watchmen kind of like... Uh, the Watchmen was a huge band for me, uh, when I was in, uh, I guess I was in high school or something around 1990. I think I saw you guys for the first time and, uh, I, I was big into music, but I, uh, for some reason I assumed that all, all rock stars were for, from somewhere else or else they were the guess who, and it was a long time ago. So I had no <laughs> idea that bands that sounded as good as the things that I saw or that I heard on city FM or whatever existed in Winnipeg. For some reason, it, I don't know whether it never occurred to me or what, yeah, but I had yeah. no idea that a band from Winnipeg could sound like the stuff that I was hearing on the radio. And I also had no idea that there were bands that were that good that I, I had no idea existed. So it kind of like, it was one of those pivotal things for me, seeing the band for the first time. Oh, and cool. just going, oh my God, yeah. there's, there's a lot more going on in Winnipeg than I'm aware of. So 
Uh, I quickly became a big fan and I've been, uh, been a bit of a Watchmen super fan ever since. So, Oh, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Yeah. Those were fun times in Winnipeg. Yeah. <laughs> And there was a lot of great bands, not yeah. just us. Yeah, it was time. such a, such yeah. such an amazing yeah. time to come out of, and uh, and you guys worked so hard. You were you were touring all the time, and uh, it was it was really impressive, especially since you guys you guys played for how long did you play for before you put out McLaren Furnace Room? Uh, we probably touring uh, three years, maybe. Three, yeah, three years before I, we were, we would sell cassettes, <laughs> independent cassettes, and we would sell cassettes for like I can't, ten dollars or something. Um, yeah, so we, we we started obviously in Winnipeg, and then we would branch out. Slowly made our way west. Originally, starting doing shows in Regina and Saskatoon, and then eventually added Calgary and uh, and Vancouver. But originally, that little that four city hub of of winnipeg regina saskatoon and calgary we rotated and we built up a following there and then we would start to go we started to go east to toronto and we when we it was such a far drive that when we'd go we'd try to stay for at least a few weeks um four of us living in one one room hotel room yeah yeah and then it just kind of kept grew and grew mm-hmm. yeah it was quite a ride for a while i guess eh? like you guys obviously worked hard to get where you were but then uh once that album came out it seemed like things really picked up steam and the band got bigger and busier from there yeah yeah at the time uh much music actually played videos and, yeah right um, <laughs> <laughs> Aren't those are the days yeah um they they picked up uh, a couple of our videos which really helped um but it was, uh, yeah, it was a lot of touring. Uh, our, our agent, Ralph James, would, we would go, we'd, sometimes there would be two shows in a day where we'd go, say, to a, a university campus and play a, a lunchtime show just for people walking by. And then we'd do an evening show at a club or, or a, a, some type of venue. And it was nonstop. Yeah, we definitely, um, it was old school winning fans over one, one fan at a time. And the, the the live show was such a huge part of what you guys did. It was just, I, I think you, uh, just from working so hard, I guess you, you developed quite a live show that people really grew to appreciate. Yeah. I think we really cut our teeth. It was a lot of shows. So it led to a lot of experience and confidence. And, and we also, we used to rehearse every single day. So if we weren't touring, we'd come home and we'd, we'd rehearse every single day for hours at the, the McLaren furnace room. That's where we got our, obviously our debut album title, but not, we'd go for five, six hours a day, nonstop. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. 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 We lived there pretty much. It was a great way to grow up. Yeah. That's for sure. Well, it was a great way to become such a great, a great band, obviously. And yeah. Uh, yeah, develop the songs and the and and the show from there. Amazing. Yeah, and then Danny really kind of found his footing as a frontman, and it just evolved in front of my eyes, which obviously <laughs> lent itself very well to the band's success. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of interesting because, in a way, you were sort of early on the leader of the band. I guess you you did the writing and and stuff like that, and then mm-hmm. Danny was pretty much just the singer, and he quickly evolved to become a writer of his own and a, and a huge live performer he did yeah he uh eventually it, well it, it 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 it's a natural progression he eventually wanted to sing his own songs and his own thoughts and uh but all along the way it was always very um you know very very understanding that i still had songs to write and he always made them his own in a way that so many people just thought they were his songs um and in, in a big way um when Ken joined the band before in the trees, he brought in a lot of riffs and a lot of ideas. And so that kind of spearheaded the evolution of writing more as a group. Um, yeah. Um, so, so we've kind of spoken once before a long time ago. Um, uh, I was doing a show at the university with Howard Manshine at one point, and you had come into the studio to talk about slow motion. I can't remember whether the the album was brand new or whether, it was closer to the end of that touring cycle, but, uh, but that was kind of when the band as a full-time entity kind of ceased. So 
Did yeah. you, it, it sounds like when, when the band ended at the time, were you still writing songs and did you have plans to go on to do more things on your own or was that, or did you just need a break totally? I, you know what? I had kind of, I had burnt out creatively in a big way. Um, it was a lot, it was just nonstop touring and nonstop pressure of writing um, with labels and A&R people. <laughs> it was just, I just burnt out. I kind of, and I think we all kind of burnt out on each other. So I, I didn't plan on not writing for as long as I did. I mean, I would write occasionally, but definitely not as uh, prolifically as I did when I was in my early 20s. And then this, so this, the last year and a bit for me has been really overwhelming artistically with all of a sudden just multiple songs and multiple things to say. Um, I can't even, I don't even, can't even describe it. So, um, it, I, I feel great, like really great about it now, but no, I, I, I don't, I definitely never anticipated, um, the writing drying up the way that it did. I also think maybe it's because knowing that I wasn't going to be in the band anymore touring, I had to, I had to really focus on other ways to make a living and how to take care of my family. And so time flies, you know, and next thing you know, <laughs> and it all worked out really well and I'm happy, but I'm, I'm happier now than I have been in a long time. So in those intervening years though, you were doing a lot of production, right? And, and did, were you making music for, for film and television? Is that right? Yeah. So all kinds of things I did music for, um, but these are, a lot of this was non, non lyrical, but I would compose for video games, um, for film. I would, I did some co-writes with other artists. Um, uh, and then I started this company of Apron music and it just, we do a lot of music for advertising. It started just with, uh, me and another guy. And now we're, there's about 35 of us here. So it's, we just do lots of advertising TV, but we also do voices and voice recordings and sound design and mixes and all kinds of stuff. So I was always writing, but now I've still, I, but I was also always running a business too. So, yeah. So obviously that's, that's not the kind of work you envisioned when you started playing music in the first place. Could, could you still feel the same kind of, uh, was, did it have it the same kind of rewards or was it an entirely different career for you? It, it was rewarding, but it wasn't the same type of reward. Like you would be proud. It was, it was more, I, I actually have a lyric about it on, on the new album, but it was more about craft than art. Like I'd be proud of what I crafted. Um, but I wouldn't have that, um, emotional artistic satisfaction that I get when from writing a song, you know, and hearing, hearing Danny sing it and then recording it and having that resonate with people. Different process. Yeah. Right. So were, were you literally off stage for years or were you, were you doing kind of live work at the time as well? I would do the odd show with friends here and there. Uh, um, and then after a certain point, um, the band got back together to do, uh, do shows, you know, so we would obviously we go to Winnipeg, we play there and we do festivals and we, ha we do an annual show here in uh, Toronto, the Danforth Music Hall, which obviously didn't happen this year based on everything, but yeah. And we do festivals and tours. So I would get satisfaction out of doing that. Definitely. Yeah. But definitely not an active live musician. No, not, not the way that I was for 15 plus years. Yeah. That coming back into the band, was there, was there hesitance to do that again or, or did it just feel like putting on comfortable shoes again when you guys first got back? I think it was like 2008 or something you guys got back. Yeah. Uh, there's some, hes there's some hesitation to it because, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't all hugs and kisses when we said goodbye to each other. That, that's for sure. There were some, some business issues and, um, ex and, and then with Sammy, um, we had, don't forget we had toured in slow motion, all that touring we did on slow motion was without him. Right. So we actually hadn't been with Sammy for even longer than, than the rest of us. But as soon as we started playing it, 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 it felt amazing and then the fact that we all were established in different careers it took a lot of pressure off and really allowed us to um play for the sake of the music and not for the, the not for the sake of 
survival. So I think that made it a much more enjoyable process. Yeah. It's been amazing to see kind of how the audience has grown from those initial shows to, to now. And it's like, you know, people my age and people, my kids age are going to the shows now and enjoying the shows. And, uh, and it just seems like, uh, I mean, there's nostalgia, but there's a certain excitement for, for younger people to develop, to, to discover the band as well. So it, it, it must be, you know, obviously you, uh, you, you know that you have a bit of a legacy and you know that people are still loving and enjoying that band. I, it, it actually doesn't cease to amaze me how amazing our fans are. And I know it sounds like a cliche, but it, they're so invested and it's been so long since we put out any, any type of new music and, um, they're so, they're so into it. They're such diehards. And when we do play shows fans come and they've seen us you know 50 100 times it's or more um you know i uh i got remarried about 10 years ago and my wife wasn't around for the heyday but she so but she comes to some of the shows now and she just she she just cannot believe how incredible our fans are and how committed they are and how you know it's it's I say yeah I'm, I'm really fortunate it and it maybe it takes a little bit of um time and distance to realize how fortunate you are to have fans like that you know as opposed to when you're kind of numb and just playing one after the other hundreds of nights a, a year you know when it's a little bit more, when it's further and farther between, um, when it's farther between you, you, you just get a better sense of appreciation, I think. So it's, it's, I think, I think I said 2008, you guys back, got back together. It's, I think we're at the point now where the second act is probably almost as long as, as the initial run of the band. At least probably well, getting yeah. close, aren't we? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of interesting, right? It it is interesting. Yeah. It is interesting. Um you know, it makes me wonder what would have been if we just kept putting out albums out, but you can't go back and change time and change the past. But um yeah, I would I think you're right in terms of years. So was there ever a, like when the, when the Watchmen got back together, was there ever a plan to, to make a new album and, and do more of the touring or was it always just like, take whatever opportunity comes up that makes sense and just do it that way. Just, just kind of live for today and, and do the shows whenever no real plan, which, which one was it? We would talk about it, um, that it would be great, um, to do it. And then we just wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think maybe some of that pressure would have been a good thing. <laughs> it w- yeah, I think so. And I, and, and that's kind of why in a way that's how the, it ended up being just Danny and I with, you know, we've got, we've got a great rhythm section on this album, but I think that's why we ended up doing it. The two of us, I just don't think it would have happened with all of us just because we're all, individually so busy and i just think it would have taken what, what we did relatively quickly in the course of a, maybe a year would have taken five or six <laughs> just you know like just even trying to when we have a show um we try to schedule a couple rehearsals and it's it's like next to impossible so i think um i'm not saying i would never say that the four of us won't record or do any new music together but there's definitely, I'll just say there was definitely always talk about it and then nobody would kind of instigate or initiate. And, and Ken is so busy too with his yeah. own stuff. Like yeah, he, he does a lot of things, he, right? Oh, a lot of things. And he's constantly writing and putting out albums and doing stuff. So I don't know. It's just, uh, didn't happen for some reason. Yeah. So, so what did happen when, when did you start writing again in this because it sounds like it, you said it was just kind of a an unexpected flurry of writing so how did that come about yeah i guess i had a few emotional experiences um and then i i, I wrote a couple songs i had a period where i wrote three songs in about three or four days which is i hadn't had that in a very long time and then i i, I contacted danny and i said can I, can I play these for you and we got together at motel his bar here in toronto and he's got a couple of like upright acoustic pianos and i played them for him and he really loved it and then and then i had a couple of ideas that 
in addition to those songs that I were kind of, I had chord changes and melodies, but no lyrics. I said, do you want to write lyrics for this? And he said, sure. And then he played me some of his songs that he had written recently and some that he had banked over the last number of years as well. He, I guess he felt inspired to go pull them out. And then we brought, we, then we would work on arrangements and then we'd bring them in here. And I played them for uh, a drummer, Ryan Chalmers, who ended up engineering and mixing the whole album and uh, Dustin Anstey on bass. And then we went to the studio and we got the amps going and hammered it out. And then we just started recording. We thought we'd do an EP and then I would go home and I would, all of a sudden I'd be watching like a Jets game or something. And then I'd hear a melody in my head and pause the game and I'd write a song in like an hour. Um, Some of those Jets games get a little boring. So my mind wanders <laughs> too. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And then next thing you know, we had you know, 14 ish songs. So we cut two of them and we're putting out a 12 song album. So pretty, pretty amazing. So it really just started like no, no plan in mind. You just had things to say and that's, that's how they came out. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember, um, one of the songs on the album, uh, which I, I can't wait for you to hear, um, love you less. I was, noodling around on the guitar and this guy came to fix my fridge and he was fixing my fridge and i wrote the song while he was in the, in the room i didn't even know the guy and i wrote it in about the whole song came out in about 20 minutes really yeah so it's a song about fixing the fridge then yeah yeah <laughs> it's about expensive ice machines in your fridge i guess or maybe yeah. you were thinking man i need some royalties to pay for this cut. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah <laughs> So it was just that natural to call Danny to, to, to play these songs for him. And, and again, was that, was that just your first thought? Like I got to run these yeah. by, by my it, longtime partner. And yeah. Yeah. I guess in the back of my mind, I thought, Hey, maybe this would be a lot simpler because Danny and I see each other a lot. And um, maybe it'd be a lot simpler if we just did something, maybe we'll do like put, I think it was also spearheaded. Danny and I were doing a couple acoustic shows. Um, Cause he came here for, for Israeli bobsled team fundraisers and stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. We played the, um, is that the park theater or uh, yeah. Well, there was one at the Met, the most recent one. The Met, the, the Met. Met. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And so the Met theater. Yeah. And, and so then we did, we did a thing with the trues, a fundraiser in Banff and, and we, it was just Danny on acoustic and we thought maybe we'd get, start to put some original music into the with the watchman stuff and the covers that we were doing in that set and then i it just kind of i guess in the back of my mind i thought this would probably be an easier process if we just do this together you know yeah so and then it, like it was never really intended to be a watchman project but does it does it still sound like the watchman for people who haven't heard it or or is there a different kind of energy because it's a different thing I think they're a little of both. I think based on it being my playing and in Danny's voice, um, it's it's definitely going to sound like The Watchmen. Um, but I think things have evolved a lot, and we're just real. We're we've learned a lot about how to record and how to craft and how to do our how to capture what we're trying to capture. But I think it, for people who are looking to find. The next, it, it's the closest you're going to get to a Watchmen album, put it that way. And uh, I think that people, it will satisfy Watchmen fans, put it that way. I think it will. Yeah. So how did, uh, how, how did the pandemic impact all of this? Was this on the go before everything shut down and this kind of gave you that time or to, to finish it? Or was it not really a consideration until you were stuck at home? We had started before the pandemic. Um, yeah, we had, we were kind of into it and going meeting at motel and, and writing and, and then we started tracking and then, and then we had, it actually, it probably would have happened quicker without the pandemic. Cause then we couldn't come into my studios and, and keep going until we were allowed to reopen. So, um, yeah, it, so it, it started before, but, um, we, we, we managed to finish it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so it's like, I guess, yeah, maybe it was a longer than a year, this whole thing. Yeah. Probably maybe a year and a half total. 
probably think we started, maybe we started in August, August ish. Yeah. So the pandemic didn't really change anything. It just hit the pause button for a while. It, it changed things. Uh, it influenced some songs throughout the process. Like I wrote a song called locked up here with you, which is obviously very pandemic influenced. Um, I wrote a song called seasick, which was kind of inspired by frontline workers and just like how emotionally and physically draining that must be. Um, so it influenced some of the songs that were written during the process. Definitely. It, it inspired some of the content. But uh, one of one of the things I talk a lot about here is like how the pandemic has influenced musicians. It, it kind of sounds though, like, like playing live and, and doing that stuff is, is not, it's, it's not a huge part of your, your income or your life anyway. It's, it sounds like it's kind of for fun. So, so did the pandemic really hurt you on a professional or creative level or anything? Well, yeah, we had a number of shows get canceled. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you're right. I'm fortunate that I don't rely on it to, for my living. So obviously every, the more you make the better, but, uh, and I, and I miss the shows. I, I look forward to them and I miss the connection with the fans and I, I, I really enjoy flying. It's pretty nice to be able to fly out on a weekend and play a, a sold out show somewhere and then go back to your, your other gig on Monday. Uh, so I, yeah, I definitely missed all those. Um, but, uh, it, it definitely didn't have the impact on me that I know it had on some, some of my friends that are still very active and rely on music, um, or live, live, live shows for their livelihood. Yeah. So do you think you'll like, are you said you missed the shows and stuff. Do you, do you think you'll appreciate it that much more once we're allowed to go back? Cause I just keep thinking, man, every show I have the opportunity to go to, I'm going to go and I'm going to have a great time just cause I'm so desperate for that now. Uh, yes, man. Uh, I, uh, I miss it as a fan. I had, I was had rage against the machine tickets. Yeah, me too. To yeah. go, <laughs> uh, you know, so technically I, I, I still to, do. Uh, I just don't know if we'll ever see the show. <laughs> I know I got to, at least I got the tool show in before this all happened. But, um, so I definitely miss it as a fan and, uh, and then, yeah, I, it, it does make you appreciate playing live that much more. I can't wait till we can do it again. Yeah. Now you yeah. guys are, are fairly lucky as, as the watchman to be able to play, bigger venues and stuff. I, I don't know if there's as much concern about that, but, uh, as the duo, are you, are you planning on playing smaller venues? And if so, do you have concern about, I'm kind of worried about some of the, some of the smaller places in town, how they're going to make it. Like, when are we, are they going to be able to make money yeah. again and how are they going to make it to that? Yeah. Well, uh, definitely worry about those venues as well. I know some have closed here in Toronto. Um, just, they can't make a go of it. I would imagine that um, Danny and I, for Sir, for the Searle and Grave stuff, there'll be smaller rooms. I, I don't think we'll be able to do the the uh, the Watchman size rooms. Um, so, and it, I guess it we'll probably do a combo of some of the shows will be acoustic, and then then some will do full band. And I would imagine that even with the full band, we'll do some Watchman songs. You know, because um, because there are songs and part of us we wrote them and we, we still enjoy playing them. People are still going to uh, want to hear them, obviously, right? Yeah. I'm sure people will shout out songs while we're <laughs> trying to do the new you're, stuff. You're not getting away from all uncovered or. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is that just a way? Is that just a way? Yeah. So we'll see. We'll just see what happens. I mean, you know, it's really interesting. We have diehard fans and we're putting out the single goes, uh, single teenage heart goes to, uh, you know, DSPs is on Friday, Spotify, Apple Music, etc. And then we're doing a radio release on Monday, but I have no idea what to expect. And Danny and I, Danny sent me a text um, over the weekend because we were just reviewing all the final masters and we're releasing vinyl. So we had to listen to it as a linear file, which is like, you listen to the whole side A and side B in one listen. And we're very, very proud. And we said, you know, hopefully people, this connects and people, lots of people listen and love it. But if not, I'm so proud of it and so happy and so glad that we got to do it. Um, you, you dropped a Neil Young cover, uh, I guess in November for his birthday, right? I caught you knocking at my cellar door. I love you, baby, 
can I have some more? Oh, the damage done. What was that all about? Was that just a, kind of a celebration of his music or was that kind of testing the waters to see what the interest would be on you guys or? Well, that was your friend, Howard Manshine. He, yeah, he uh, was doing a thing for, uh, I guess, a, a piece for Neil Young's birthday and asked if we could, he got in touch with us saying, hey, can you guys give, give, give me some quotes? He knows that I'm a big fan. I said, we'll do you one better. We'll, we'll record a cover because we were, we were doing Needle at, uh, at our live shows, the acoustic stuff that we were talking about earlier. So we jumped in the studio here while we were, Danny was, I knew Danny would be here. We were tracking for the Serlin Graves album. And then I said, do you want to just record Neil? And I just did a quick guitar pass. He dropped a vocal on it. And then uh, there you go. It was that easy. Yeah. Eh? It was that easy. I did it one take. Uh, Danny was teasing me. He goes, can you hurry up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I, you know what? His voice it's tough when you do these iconic songs that are just like, you know, and, but if anyone can pull it off and I say this cautiously, make it their own, like make a Neil Young song, their own. He well, can, you can't do it. Neil style. Yeah. You got to do something. No, else. I mean, no, you got to change it somewhat. Yeah. Well, I, I dare say he technically, he probably sang it better, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so the new single is coming out, uh, and what's the deal with the, with the rest of the record? So the rest of the record's coming out May 28th and I may, we might drop another single before, before that. We'll see. We'll see how things go. Everything's changed. I don't know how it works anymore. <laughs> I, I'm talking to, uh, you know, the publicity people and it's all social media and content, content, content. But we'll, anyway, the full album's coming out May 28th, full vinyl release um, and digital. Um, just finishing up all the artwork and working on a couple of video concepts and it's, it's fun. Yeah, it's very, very fun. Can't wait to share it with people. Can we slip the name of the album in here or is that still a closely guarded secret? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's called so Sad Songs for Sale. And and is that indicative of, of of the tone of the album at all? Or there's some yeah. Listen, there there's some posit positivity to the album, and there's some uplifting moments. But you know, Danny and I have both been through a lot in um, in terms of you know, failed marriages and tough times and reinvention. And um, so there's there's I guess the benefit of having. 20 years between albums is it gives you a lot, to, a lot to write about. And, uh, you know, it's all right there out for everybody to hear. It's like very honest and, and heartfelt and sincere. And, and I would imagine just the fact that you're doing this again, there must be a lot of that excitement that you felt a long time ago and a lot of that passion and a lot of that, uh, you know, just urgency to get this music out there and, uh, and get some feedback on it as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I remember like it was yesterday, when we put out our first album and we were driving from Calgary to Vancouver. And as we got closer to Vancouver, I heard uh, our song cracked on the radio for the first time. And if I could be so lucky as to have that feeling again on this album, I would be very grateful. You know, Is there, is there a label involved or are you guys doing this all yourself? We have, so I have a little, I have an indie label called fifth kid records. Um, and it's distributed by Fontana North, or, sorry, by Fontana. And, uh, and then we've hired independent radio promo and publicists to help us with it. So you are going to market it to all the usual like rock radio stuff as well. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And from what I've heard for certainly from the first single and, and from the, uh, I think you've teased a couple of other tracks. It's, it's, it sounds like it's going to be, uh, perfect for, uh, cranking down the window and, uh, and driving around at this stuff blasting out of the car, I think. I think so too. I like the timing of it. I think uh, it could be well timed with the spring coming and people getting vaccinated and hopefully back to. Uh, I know it's a while yet, but at least we're starting to track towards getting back to normal. I think the the timing of it could be really nice in terms of the music being a part of that experience. 
Well, let's let's pretend we know what's going to happen. Uh, ideally, so are there going to be if if it were possible, are there going to be release shows? Is there going to be a bit of a tour for this? What's what's the plan there? Yeah, we're definitely working on a. We're planning that there won't not planning, but we are assuming that we won't be able to play live with people in the room by by May um, when the album comes out. So we are working on a streaming a live a live performance for the release. Um, well, you got to think, you know, a guy with a, <laughs> with a little bit of a, a great place to put on a show, maybe with nobody yes, there. Exactly. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like rocket surgery to me to, to throw, throw a camera up in motel and uh, maybe stream a little show from there or something. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll be doing something like that for, for everybody. But once it is safe to do so, we can we can expect you to come to Winnipeg and and do a show in Toronto and stuff like that. Absolutely, we're already talking about Watchmen shows for Winnipeg and Sterling Grave shows for oh, Winnipeg. Oh God, yeah. So, yeah, we miss yeah. you. I think it's yeah. been it's been pretty much every year since two thousand eight that you've you've played here in Winnipeg. So this this is this is a long stretch to go I know. without a, without a show here. So we definitely I miss agree. you and look forward to that for sure. Yeah, us too. We miss it. So so. Uh, saying that i guess the other the other guys aren't too mad about you guys making the record without them <laughs> i don't know <laughs> uh, mixed reviews on that one i'll say <laughs> yeah yeah uh, you guys have, it's you guys have put a lot of things in the past so ho- hopefully we can yeah we've been through a lot we'll get through this one <laughs> okay. that's, that's good so long as we're uh you know, we're, we're, we're not signaling the end again. We, we can't go through no. that again. No, we'll, we'll be okay. We'll be okay. <laughs> Excellent. The question is, can I, can we get them to play these songs? That oh, be- well, <laughs> that, is a, that is a question, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe you have to do split shows where you guys open for yourselves or something. And yeah. Do a bit of a, be- a low key thing and then bring the band out or something like that. Yeah, exactly. There yeah. you go. There you go. Diplomacy. So is there a website or do we just follow you on social media? How do, how do we know what's, what's going on and what's where to be? Yeah. So there's a website. It's there. Um, there's also, uh, you can follow us on our Twitter feeds and, uh, Instagram. Um, that's where we've been doing little teasers and updates about the new release. Um, so I think it's just at Serlin Graves for Twitter and Serlin underscore Graves at, on Instagram and uh, Facebook as well. And, We'll just keep building this thing as we go, you know? Yeah. Okay. I want to play Teenage Heart here coming up. What what can you tell me about that song? There's a bit of a story behind that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, I have, I have too many kids. (laughs) (laughs) I think we all say that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I've had wide age range and I've watched my, um, my oldest daughter and my son kind of navigate growing up in this social media age. And it, it, it can, makes me a little sad. So, you know, that the, 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 the weight and the importance that's put on superficial things and um, it's disappointing to me. And so this is just a song that kind of speaks to that and encouraging people not to get, not to succumb to the, the pressures of external judgment, but just try trying to, Sure, it's trying to navigate your own path and be true to yourself. And so the obvious question is, what what do they think of it? Are they just, oh, come on, Dad, we're fine. <laughs> well, what's what's the kid review of the of this? Did they get the message? They think they got the message. They 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 like the song a lot. There's there's little. They're all over this album in different ways because they're such a big part of my life. Um, so I think I think they I think they're really into it. Um, like I, I was mentioning earlier about my my wife is that they they don't quite know what my life was before I, I stopped doing this very stopped touring and so like for example my son well my my kids came came my youngest ones are too small but my kids came to our last Danforth show and they just can't believe the way that the crowd sings every single word of every song and and I think they find it really cool yeah I think they really enjoy it. So that's great. So you don't want them to be embarrassed of you. So that's that's you know, <laughs> that's it's, it's not that foreign to them. 
Yeah, I, it's funny. I think I still do embarrass them, even though I, well, I, I think hope so. Pretty, I think I'm pretty cool, but I don't know. <laughs> they actually help me with my social media. I'm like, how do you do this? And how do you do that? So, <laughs> how do you how do you how, how do you do that thing where you write on the on the post? Like, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, just real quickly, the, the the artwork is is brilliant for the single. It it just kind of looks like uh, you know what we what we would draw in our binders uh, when we were kids, I guess. Who drew that? Where did that come from? Dustin did that. He actually uh, the the bassist on the on the album. He's a he's a genius in all things visual, and uh, we just were kind of j- talking about the idea. And he came back into the studio half hour later. He goes something like this. <laughs> um, we had to redo it because it had like Metallica and ACDC logos, and we thought um, they might not like that. So he's he's done. He does all the f- he's doing all the album art, the photography, um, all the fonts, everything. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. These guys are great. They, uh, Ryan and Dustin really injected a lot of, uh, passion and enthusiasm into the project. I think it was infectious for Danny and I, you know? Okay. Well, we really look forward to the, to the rest of the record and, uh, certainly looking forward to Winnipeg shows and, uh, whatever else is to come. I, I, I hope you, I hope you play and, and make music for a long, long time. It, it really means a lot to me. Oh, thanks, man. It, it, I really appreciate you saying that. Just frozen and contemplating Considering who's a letter down Just sick and tired of all waiting For the hurt to turn back around Just take your tender damage to you can find out more about Serlin Graves on their social media accounts and at serlingraves.com. Hopefully soon the Watchmen will get to continue to perform packed shows across Canada. That band's website is the-watchmen.com. There's also a really active Facebook group called the Watchmen Fan Forum. I really appreciate you listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode where I just sat around and talked about music. We'll get into more of the tough stuff again next week. I got some great guests coming up for you, and I know you're going to learn a lot. Probably the best way to stay on top of the show is to subscribe at our website, flywithyourshadow.com. You can put in your email address right on the front there and be notified every time a new episode drops. You can also follow us on your favorite podcast provider, Spotify, Apple Music, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, or all kinds of other places as well. It really helps the show if you leave a review on one of those places. And even more so if you tell a friend who might be interested in the show about it, that's the best way to help spread the word. I really thank you for listening. I hope you'll join me again on the next episode of Fly With Your Shadow. Somebody.